Welcome to this special feature length webinar on making an enduring power of attorney. Hello, I'm Philippa McDonald. Thank you for joining me. I wish to acknowledge the traditional owners of country throughout Australia and recognize their continuing connection to land, waters and culture. I pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging. This webinar is brought to you by Compass. Compass is the national website connecting people to services and information, tackling elder abuse in all its forms. Compass is created by Elder Abuse Action Australia with funding from the Australian government's Attorney General's Department. Compass is committed to ensuring equitable and inclusive responses to end elder abuse for everyone affected, including people with diverse characteristics and life experiences. If you or someone you know needs help tackling elder abuse, go to www.compass.info. There is also an elder helpline, 1800 Elder Help. That's 1-800-353-374, 1-800-353-374. During this session, I urge you to ask questions in the chat box, to be respectful and not to identify people. But before I introduce our expert panellists, let's take a look at this introduction to an enduring power of attorney. At any stage of life, people have financial decisions to make from buying or selling a house to smaller items like budgeting for groceries. Sometimes things happen that affect our ability to make decisions for ourselves. So what happens if you lose the ability to manage your own financial affairs? Who will decide to pay your bills or choose how your care will be funded? To ensure that your financial affairs will always be looked after as you would want them to be, you can decide to make an enduring power of attorney. An enduring power of attorney sets out what decisions can and can't be made on your behalf by someone that you can trust to make financial decisions for you. There are a few things you might want to know to get started, such as, what is an enduring power of attorney? How do I set one up in my state or territory? What are the rules around changing my enduring power of attorney? How do I go about choosing the right attorney for my needs? And how do you determine if someone has lost capacity to make decisions for themselves? You can find the answers to these questions and more on the Powers of Attorney section at compass.info. Now it's my pleasure to introduce our panellists. John Chesterman is the Queensland Public Advocate, a lawyer and historian by training. John has expertise in the fields of human rights, guardianship, supported decision-making, powers of attorney and elder abuse. Prior to taking up his current position, John was Victoria's Deputy Public Advocate. He's previously undertaken a Churchill Fellowship on the topic of adult safeguarding. And his books include as co-author, The Politics of Human Rights in Australia. Karen Williams has worked as a social worker in health, emergency and mental health care in New South Wales and Queensland, both in rural and metropolitan areas. She has qualifications in health management and law and has established ADA Law, where she is now Principal Lawyer, Principal Solicitor. And ADA is a program of ADA Australia. She assists people who find themselves in vulnerable situations around decision making. This can include enduring powers of attorney, guardianship and administration. Karen is also the co-author of Elder Law, A Guide to Working with Older Australians. Now, lastly, but not least, Dr. Patricia Riez is a Director of Medical Services at the War Memorial Hospital in Waverley in Sydney and a Consultant Geriatrician at St Vincent's Hospital, Sydney. 
She is a fellow of the Royal Australasian College of Physicians and a conjoint senior lecturer at the University of New South Wales Medical School. Dr. Riez is the clinical lead at St. Vincent's and War Memorial's Justice Partnership, integrating legal services into healthcare. So welcome, John, Karen, and Patricia. Thank you. John, I'm going to start with you. What is an enduring power of attorney? And what I'm going to try and do here is not have any acronyms. We're going to say it for all its glory, enduring power of attorney. It can seem daunting. It is daunting. Thanks, Philippa. Uh, an enduring power of attorney is a, a mechanism a signed and witnessed document by which a person can appoint one or more others to make decisions for you now and or in the event that you cannot make your own decisions. So the power endures beyond a loss of capacity to make a particular decision. That's the word enduring. Uh, it's important to know that all states and territories have their own laws concerning enduring powers of attorney, but that they all enable people to appoint others to make decisions for them in the medical treatment, uh, financial areas, and in personal areas such as where a person lives. So when we talk about financial enduring powers of attorney, we often use the term power of attorney that enables someone to make financial decisions. And they can come into force either when you sign the thing or later on when you lose your capacity to make financial decisions. Other, we'll call them enduring powers of attorney, enable a person to make personal or lifestyle decisions or medical treatment decisions. They typically only take effect when a person loses the capacity to make those particular decisions. Confusingly, when we talk about the medical treatment and personal powers of attorney, they're called different things in different jurisdictions. Some places, Victoria, Queensland, the ACT call that an enduring power of attorney. In WA, it's called, sorry, acronym. In Western Australia, it's an enduring power of guardianship. In Tasmania, New South Wales, enduring guardianship, medical treatment decision maker in Victoria for medical decisions. South Australia, substitute decision maker. So you have to look at each state and territory's mechanisms when you actually go to complete a document. But the broad story is that an enduring power of attorney enables you to appoint someone else to make decisions for you should you lose the capacity to make those decisions. Well, thank you. It sounds like a minefield, but we're breaking it down and it and we can just strip it back to what we really need to know. And we'll be covering a lot of ground here. So Karen Williams, what are the key things to think about? Oh, yes, thank you, uh, Philippa, and welcome everyone. Um, the first thing I think, which the video touched on, it's the hardest thing to think about is being in a situation where someone else is making decisions for you. So putting that to one side, the other key things are who are you going to choose? So the who of enduring powers of attorney, what, what decisions these people or attorneys can make for you, how are they to make the decision? So the how, um, must they do it um, involving you or any other uh, mechanisms you, you might write down in the document? And when, when is it to start? John's already talked about that. Is it an immediate start or is it to happen at a certain point, such as when you lose capacity or some other time that you may nominate in the document? So key things, who, what, how and when. Look, that's terrific. Who, what, when and how and yes. Um, and then when do you begin having these conversations about the future? And we've got this terrific video about having conversations about the future. It's a real conversation starter. Let's have a look at this. You know, I think it's really confronting to think of not being able to make my own decisions. I agree, and that's why it's so important to let people know what your thoughts are, what your decisions are, because if you're clear about that, there's much less chance that there's going to be stress down the track. 
Well, I heard of one family who started this whole discussion over a family dinner and they all started recording their own wishes on their phones, <laughs> even the younger people. Really? Well, the beauty of that, no matter how you do it, is that at least everyone's clear and people know what your intentions are and it just means that there's no stress about the whole thing. I know, but it can be hard to start that conversation. We heard of a woman whose sons refused to speak with her about future planning. Uh, they said it's too morbid uh, and wouldn't talk about it. So she developed a book, she put a picture of a car on the front, she called it her car kit, and they were curious when they saw it and it opened up the discussion in a lighter way. You might want to write a letter to the important people in your life explaining what your values and beliefs are. You could also record that on your phone and maybe circulate it to the important people in your life. I think a really good place to start is by not talking to everyone, choosing the people you want to talk to and people really, really close to you. It's not a one-off discussion, is it? Like, things can change. You may no longer be happy with your attorney that you've appointed. Your attorney may no, may no longer live close to you. Then a conflict may have arisen between your attorney and yourself and you may need to review that decision. You won't retire. Well, I don't know that I'd be working at 96 years old. I love surveying. I love getting out in the fresh air, I like doing the computations, the drawing. I really enjoy it. So what is the plan if you get hit by a bus? Well, if I've carked it all together, my body goes to the University of Melbourne. Otherwise, if I'm just badly injured or something, Mem would know what to do. So you're going to do a power of attorney and make Mem the attorney? Yes. So that's OK for you? Yes. And who's going to do yours, Mem? I'll have to think it over. Look, I think the most important thing is to be proactive, to not wait till it's too late, to be ahead of the curve. This is not just for people living with dementia or older people, it's for all of us and it's a natural and healthy approach. Here, I'm going to bring John Chesterman in here. And I think it's really important to stress that this is something that's proactive and it's a healthy approach and it's something that's very positive that you're doing for yourself to protect yourself. And so, John, can I bring you in here with your comments about what you've just seen in this terrific video? Thanks, Philippa. I've seen that video many times, and I think it's the best video I've ever seen about starting conversations. It's really important. Um, and it makes the point that conversations are the important part. They may lead down the track to the creation of a legal document, such as an enduring power of attorney, but conversations are important. Um, as Mandy in that video from Senior Rights Victoria said, it can be hard to start the conversation and can sometimes and an instant reaction from people can be, oh, that's a morbid topic to bring up. But the response to that, if someone does show discomfort, they don't want to have that conversation now, is to say, well, when would be a good time? Uh, if the answer is never, well, that's unfortunate. And the point I always make in talking about enduring powers of attorney and having conversations about future planning is that it's never too early to have those conversations, but it can be too late. Um, things can happen. It, we can't just assume that any loss of capacity would be a gradual decline. It could happen, unfortunately, through a car accident, a stroke, uh, or any range of um, tragedies that could befall a person. It's very important to have those conversations early. And it's important that it's, it can be an ongoing conversation. It can be fun. Um, uh, and it can take place over a long period of time, many smaller conversations. So I know with my own father who had declining um, health, he had dementia and died several years ago, but at stages of that journey, my mother would be indicating to me, oh, I would want that or I wouldn't want that. And I was taking a note of the things that she was saying. And one day she wrote down on a bit of paper, the hymns she would like at a funeral. So I took, of course, what you do, I took a photo of that page. So it's important to think about this as 
a, a process, conversations. It may lead to the creation of a document, but the conversations are what's really important. So the fun bit was getting the hymns to your mother's funeral. That's right. I now have to get someone to, she's a pianist and organist, so I now have to get someone to play them. That's a different issue, but uh, yes, that's right. Oh, maybe you've got time on your side to start learning yourself. But uh, <laughs> um, so, yeah, never too late, uh, never too early, but it can be too late. I mean, these are the things we've got to remember. So, Karen Williams, who should an attorney, who should be your enduring power of attorney? Um, it, it's somebody who you need to consider um, closely and um, who's going to, to fit in with your values and also the way you tend to approach your decisions. So um, there's a number of, of requirements, but, but you want someone who's going to step into your shoes in a seamless way as possible. So someone you trust, someone in who's going to take the job seriously and think of it as a job and um, be able to follow through with some of these discussions that you've hopefully had or, or documents that, that you've left for them and implement the decisions as you would have done it yourself. And so there's a lot to think about. And I think we really almost love, could do with a, a checklist of helpful tips. So I'd like to bring Karen, you back again with John to give us some helpful tips. And we've got a great slide here so take it away, John and Karen, of some helpful tips, something we can grab onto as we have these delicate conversations and think about this really important issue. Picking up someone who, who trusts, who shares the same values and, um, and moving on, if choosing more than one person, which has, has its benefits of having more than one, um, because it can be quite an onerous job at times. Think about how they're going to be able to talk to each other, if not talk, text, communicate in some way. At least in the digital world, we have lots of different ways. They don't have to be geographically close to each other, but they have to be able to communicate and, and get on to at least a basic extent. Um, and then when you're thinking about it as, as a job, think about what powers to give. So what is it that you want them to do? What is it that you may not want them to do? And then the when, as I talked about, when powers will start. And thanks, over to you, John. Sure, thanks, Karen. And just building on what Karen said, on the issue of, um, of uh, when, as I mentioned earlier, the enduring powers of attorney that enable a person to make what we call personal or lifestyle decisions or medical treatment decisions tend to take effect when a person does not have capacity to make a particular decision. Financial ones, however, except in the Northern Territory, uh, elsewhere, financial enduring powers of attorney can take effect immediately or later, um, such as when a person doesn't have capacity to make their own decisions. A couple of other important points just to bear in mind. Um, one is that the person who signs the enduring power of attorney to enable someone to make decisions for that person is the one who makes the decision to sign the document. You sometimes hear about a family member bringing in mum because, you know, I'm going to complete an enduring power of attorney for mum. Now, the point is, it's mum who has to complete the enduring power of attorney, not, not, the, not in that case, the adult child. Another point to know is that there is no obligation on people to complete an enduring power of attorney. I always say it's very important to think about completing one, but there's no obligation to complete one, including people are sometimes told at aged care facilities they must have an enduring power of attorney. That, that's wrong. There is no obligation to have one. It's just something we encourage people to think about. Um, lastly, it's important to remember also that even with an enduring power of attorney in place, a person can still... Um, make their own decisions while they still have the capacity to make decisions. And even if the person doesn't have the capacity to make their own decisions, their thoughts and wishes remain very important and should always be sought out. So it's a common error that people think, well, I've been appointed as attorney, therefore I can just go ahead and do whatever I like without talking to mum. No, that's not right. You've got to be talking to mum and listening and acting to the extent that, in that case, mum is able to express her views and wishes also encourage people to review their powers of attorney. I'm seeing some um, 
excellent questions come up in the chat and I'm resisting the temptation to jump in to answer them, but uh, some really good questions will come to those later on. Um, and the other thing to note too, even if you have completed the enduring power of attorney, you can always revoke it if you're no longer happy with it, so long as you have the capacity to do that. Thanks. And I think it's really important for people to remember that, um, that, you know, if if it's not going to be the right person into the future, something's happened and you're no longer comfortable with that, it's fairly simple to revoke it and put someone else in. And look, I will throw a question to you there, John, because the chat's going on. If you have previously set up an enduring power of attorney in the Northern Territory, but now live in Queensland, do you have to set up a new power of attorney in the new location? No, Queensland legislation, this is the case in its jurisdiction, um, tends to recognise an enduring power of attorney from another jurisdiction in Australia uh, and here even New Zealand in Queensland, to the extent that you could make that power in the jurisdiction. So to the extent that that enduring power of attorney from the Northern Territory could be made here, it would be recognised in Queensland. And and then does an enduring power of attorney need to be lodged with a government agency? I mean, this gets us into some other waters here. Um, if so, at what point, and is there any cost involved in this? Yes. Uh, so um, I, let's start with Tasmania. In Tasmania, um, financial enduring power of attorney has to be lodged with the land titles office at, at a cost of $149.32. I've done my background. Um, and... Uh, an enduring guardianship form in Tasmania has to be lodged through a service Tasmania outlet at a cost of $74.25. Other jurisdictions tend to require an enduring power of attorney to be registered if it's to be used in relation to real estate. There is in development, it's still some time away, an idea for a national register of financial enduring powers of attorney that is on the national agenda, but we haven't got there yet. Yes. Well, look, thank you. And look, the checklist can be found on Compass and a link to this and all the slides in the presentation will be emailed to everyone tomorrow, along with a recording of the entire webinar, because obviously this is a very detailed, rich webinar, um, and these checklists will be really helpful. So again, we get back to that, that thought that we're always asking ourselves, well, what are the chances that I might need one? And we've got this video that addresses that. Uh, the video, what are the chances? Let's take a look. So the chances of winning the gold lotto? Probably zilch. Approximately one in 45 million, yes. That's why I never spend a lot of money on lotto tickets. The chances of being killed in a shark attack. <laughs> Probably low because we live on land. One in eight million. <laughs> the chances of meeting someone you'll fall in love with. I think that's probably about right. Goodness me. That's cute. The chances of having a stroke? Probably one in a thousand. Oh. Someone has a stroke every nine minutes. Wow, that's, yeah. The chances of suffering a brain injury in your lifetime. Oh, one in 50 million. One in 45 people suffer an acquired brain injury. And 75% of those are under 65. Wow. The chances of getting dementia. This, to me, is a very frightening one. One person every six minutes is diagnosed with dementia. This means nearly half a million Australians live with dementia. And I know some of them, so yes, I can well believe that. The chances of losing capacity to make decisions at some point in your life. Yep, that could be higher too. Oof. I hope I always can. They're good questions. I haven't done a great deal of thinking about me being in a position where I'm not going to be able to make my own decisions later in life. If I lost the capacity to make decisions for myself, I hope my family would make the right decisions for me. I believe that my daughters and family would have the capacity to take over. I would hope that my wife would know what I want, but I'm also assuming that it's my wife that's going to be making these decisions and I wouldn't know that either. Have you ever heard of an enduring power of attorney? The enduring power of attorney? No, I've never heard that. I have heard of it, but I don't know like the function, I guess.
Uh, number one, choose someone you trust who would speak for you in the future. Write it down in an enduring power of attorney. Share it with the people who need to know. And number four, live your life. Live your life. And live your life. So yeah, it's got me thinking now. <laughs> I like that. Can I keep that? <laughs>
Uh, I tend to have a collaborative approach when I do my assessment, because what's also important is getting collateral information, especially if the person has lost insight or awareness into their difficulties. And for them, everything's been working fine for all these years. There's no, there's no problem. But then when you speak to the people around them, they're actually not doing well. They're forgetting to eat. They're mismanaging their medications. They're not paying their bills on time because they've forgotten. So it's important when I'm assessing capacity as well that I am flexible when I make that assessment because the environment or the timing may also be crucial. Um, having an interpreter service if language is an issue um, and also making not making any value judgments. Um, my job as a clinician is to assess the capacity to make the decision, not the decision itself. People are allowed to make silly decisions. So um, it's, it, I'm not there to actually make judgment on that. My job is to check if there are factors that influence that person's ability to make a decision. Wow. Well, I'd want you to be my geriatrician or consultant <laughs> doctor, I think. Um, just given that that flexibility and all the aspects that you look at. And um, I, we, we do have a question that I'll just do a quick follow up um, from uh, KR asking, is there any service to secondary consult with in regards to people's capacity? So could you ask someone else, like if, if you deem me not to have capacity, could I jump up and down and say, I want a second opinion? Definitely. Sometimes you might even get a second or a third opinion, especially if the um, capacity is being um, uh, contentious, the assessment itself has been contentious. Um, and that's the problem is capacity assessments are not straightforward. Um, and I might step back a bit and in, in, in talk about when do I actually need to get a capacity assessment? What's the instance that should trigger us to be asking do I need to do a capacity assessment? Because um, we make hundreds of decisions every day. I wake up in the morning, I have to decide what do I eat, what do I wear? Those are relatively simple decisions. The consequences of it are not major. So we let those go. But the more complicated the decisions you have to make, for example, I don't have a lot of money. Do I buy this expensive watch? Um, do I sell my house now or wait for the bubble to, to burst? Um, or do I appoint my son or my daughter my power of attorney so they can manage all my finances? The more complex the decision, the more important it becomes to ensure that when that person is making that decision, they have capacity at the time they're making it. Um, so the thing to say here is capacity is decision specific. Um, we make heaps of decisions. Not every decision we need to make a capacity assessment needs to be made. What are the triggers for you to think, mm, maybe I need to ask for an assessment if, you're, if the person appears to be confused or overwhelmed or even anxious? Um, I do a dementia clinic, a cognitive disorders clinic. Anxiety is one big presenting factor. When people have too many choices, they get overwhelmed and that manifests as anxiety. So anxiety sometimes is thought of as a mental health disorder, but actually it turns out it's a cognitive disorder. If, if that person is suddenly making uh, decisions that put them in harm's way, or making repeated decisions that appear to be very out of character for that person, like they were previously very careful with their money and then suddenly they're now giving it away. That might be a trigger to think, mm, maybe I need to get a capacity assessment. If it looks like their memory or their language skills are changing, if their personality is changing, um, if they look like they're not looking after themselves, where before they were quite fastidious in their appearance, suddenly they're looking a bit unkempt, they're losing weight, maybe they're not eating well. These are some triggers that we should be thinking of and make us alert that mm, maybe I actually need to get an opinion. And there are different people who can actually make a capacity assessment depending on the decision that needs to be made. So sometimes if it's a health decision, your primary health care provider or your GP might be able to help. If it's a financial decision, 
um, sometimes um, even at a basic level, you're at a bank uh, and suddenly this person is withdrawing $10,000 and is appearing confused about, hmm, should I be, should I be giving? So, so even the bank teller, say, for example, might be saying, oh, I'm worried that this person's actually not making the right decision as they're trying to withdraw a large amount of money. That person also needs to say, I might need to do a capacity assessment. I'm going to talk to my manager and not actually. So it's not always a medical decision because it's very decision specific, but you can definitely get more opinions as the situation becomes more complex. And they can call me, for example, they can call a neuropsychologist or a psychiatrist. That's hugely helpful. And thank you. And uh, I, I also, what resonated was it can be temporary or permanent, that loss of capacity. And um, and also uh, some, there might be some symptoms or diagnoses which don't really lead to immediate, uh, don't immediately affect your decision-making. So I'd like to bring Karen Williams he, in here. Um, so a particular diagnosis is not an automatic, it's an autom not an automatic trigger for a determination. So we can't have a set and forget scenario of a loss of capacity. I, I'm hoping you can simplify my, my question to you, Karen, if you know what I mean. I mean yes, thank you, Philippa. Um, when I'm talking about this particular aspect, um, uh, particularly with health professionals and, and others, I'll say diagnosis is, is only a clue on this capacity trail. It's, it's a beginning point, and, and um, Dr. Reyes has explained that that's the starting point. Unfortunately, a lot of us, because we do get overwhelmed in this area, we put our pens down and just like, okay, we've got a diagnosis now, off we go. No, no, it's the beginning of this journey. It's a clue. And also people may have more than one diagnosis at the time, which is not immediately necessary. So you may have a diagnosis of early onset or early stages of dementia, but have not much functional changes in, in your, your ability to make decisions. But you might also have just a minor um, infection, which impacts your capacity and is very short term and um, can be treated. So capacity, I think it's really important to introduce the concept that it needs, assessments can be complex, but also it needs to be monitored because you don't want your decision maker to step in and never step back out again if you regain capacity. It's about having that involved or seeing it as a, as a partnership. So these concepts are crucial in, um, in, in this journey. Look, thank you. And I'd like to bring Dr. Uh, Patricia Riez back in again, uh, because, you know, I suppose you could have situations of delirium, but could you give us an example of what you might encounter in the, um, in the medical setting? Yep. Um, you mentioned the word delirium. Um, and I might uh, just use that as an example. To just yep. mute for I, a moment. Um, okay. Um, Hi, Jen. Pamela. Yeah. Good. Sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, so the example I find in hospital, um, in both you and Karen had actually alluded to it, early dementia is a tricky situation because one day have a label that that person has dementia and may have a, a diagnosis that impacts on their decision making. However, when it's early, a lot of the times that person can still understand most of the things that are happening around them. But in the setting of illness, say for example, a urinary tract infection, the more severe the illness, uh, say for example, a heart attack, and in in, in that might trigger, even if it's a minor heart attack, it's enough to disrupt the blood flow to the brain. So once that heart attack has settled, it's been treated, the infection has settled and it's treated, um, that delirium or that period of increased confusion might settle down and they might be able to make decisions for themselves again. But the most common setting is that in hospital, they come in critically ill, they're unable to make that decision, they recover a little bit, 
but not completely because delirium sometimes linger um, for a little bit longer. But we need to come up to a decision about what to do when they leave hospital. So it's about setting them up with services at home or finding them temporary accommodations that's not home. And that's when you actually start needing to assess capacity at that time and speak to powers of attorney, because these can be quite complicated decisions, who funds or who pays for the services when they go home, if they can't afford that, if they need to go to a nursing home, who makes the payments and the financial decisions there. So that's the most common example in hospital, um, but there's plenty of scenarios both in and out of hospital that um, is a trigger for either a capacity assessment or the use of a power of attorney. Look, thank you so much. So it's anything but black and white. And you mentioned dementia and so did Karen. And dementia in all its forms, in all its stages, and, and you can't sort of look into a crystal ball and say this or that's going to happen. But Dementia Australia has given us some wonderful slides to consider. Um, Dementia remains widely misunderstood in the broader Australian community and people living with the condition continue to experience stigma and discrimination as a result. There are many misconceptions about dementia and some of the most common relate to issues around decision making and capacity. And dementia is an umbrella term that encompasses more than 100 different types of neurocognitive disorders. The most common is Alzheimer's disease. There are symptoms and consequences that are common to different dementia types, but every person diagnosed with dementia will experience the condition in their own way. A diagnosis of dementia does not mean that a person loses capacity or decision-making ability. It's critical that a person living with dementia is involved in making decisions that will have an impact on all aspects of their lives, including financial and medical issues for as long as possible. Now, here we get to supported decision-making. A supported decision-making model, known as SDM, I'm breaking my rules, recognises the importance of making decisions with rather decisions with rather than for the person, supporting people with cognitive disabilities to exercise their legal rights about decisions that affect their lives with appropriate assistance from a team of people who they know and trust. Now, Dementia Australia endorses a spectrum model of supported decision-making, acknowledging that different levels and types of support will be required to maximize a person's involvement in decision-making for as long as possible over the dementia trajectory. And look, these are terrific slides and here are some of the recommended resources. Um, I know with a family member, some of these resources, or all of these resources, we were hungry for information, were a fantastic help. Um, and can be shared with members of the family uh, as you make those decisions and support your loved one. Or if you have dementia, make clear that you want to partner with someone in making those decisions, which are hugely important. And as we saw with one of the videos, dementia affects so many of us. Uh, and, you know, something like, an estimated half a million Australians living with dementia. Our friends, our family members, perhaps uh, the people among us. So these helpful resources, uh, I would recommend they will be part of the package that will come to you after this webinar. So supportive decision-making, could I bring in Patricia, Karen and John to briefly define how you see supportive decision making. And Patricia, you can show us how you're seeing it in real time. Um, um, yeah. Yeah, that's great. I actually have a recent example um, of a patient 
who lived out in the country uh, had to come into hospital because he had a large neck cancer that needed to be operated on. Um, it was a very high risk surgery. And with the risks that even after the surgery and the cancer was out, his swallowing and his speech could be affected. So uh, a surgery that could have a lot of complications and affect his quality of life moving forward. Usually these types of surgery require a robust conversation around risks and benefits. Um, and as it turned out, uh, the, one of the things we do now before these types of surgeries to do a just quick cognitive screen. And they had picked up that this person had quite significant cognitive impairment. So no diagnosis, because he doesn't like to see the doctor. He lives quite isolated, um, completely under the radar. But it turns out that his memory wasn't too good and he was having silent strokes in the background. So then they call me over um, and I do that um, process that I had outlined earlier. And it was quite clear that although he was agreeable to have the operation, he did not have the full understanding of what was going to be involved and he needed supports there. The good thing is he had really good close friends who they'd already had conversations before about what his values are, what his beliefs are, really wanting to live as independently as possible um, for as long as possible out in his um, acreage. And so we were able to, before he had the operation, before he had anything risky um, uh, done further, he had his power of attorney and enduring guardian um, uh, paperwork sorted. And that person could then be at the consultation with myself and the surgeon to talk about the risks and benefits, make sure he understood. In this context, if you give the information in small bits, so he could process it, use his own context or his own history uh, to actually help him understand what was going on. It was much more manageable for him to make a decision to proceed with surgery because he was supported by his doctors and his advocate or his attorney um, at that time. Fantastic. And Karen, can I just ask you to give us an idea of the supportive decision making that you're seeing? Yes, I can give um, an example as well. So I, I say to people, support like beauty is in the eye of the beholder. So a supporter is someone who enables you to make the decisions that, that you want to make. So it's not, it's not a, another word just for, for family or attorney or whatever. It, they have to actually support you. So I've, I've seen um, when major decisions are to be made with an older person, as it was in this case, that there would be like a family conference and get everyone on the phone. It was COVID time, so it was well known possible to get people around the table or the bedside. So it would have a conference, we'd all throw our 10 seconds worth in, and it's ultimately the decision for the older person or the principal of the maker of the enduring power of attorney. Okay, what is it that you want to do? You've heard what um, our thoughts are. How can and how can we support you to get there? What's really important to you at this time? Okay, now we know what the next steps are. That's very helpful. So, John, can I bring you in here too for your comments? Sure. Thanks, Philippa. Um, um, so, supportive decision making is. It's a relatively recent phenomenon in, in, to the extent that we're increasingly seeing uh, in human rights terms, a requirement for people to be supported to make their own decisions rather than have someone step in and make decisions for them. But the, the idea behind support decision making is actually a very old one. Many of us rely on support to make any complex decisions. We rely on financial advice, we rely on medical expertise in, in making decisions. So supported decision making really just extends that a little to say that a person, for instance, with some degree of cognitive decline might still be able to make their own decisions if someone, as Patricia was saying before, steps the person through the various elements of a decision that need to be made. And we are seeing also in Australia increasing legal recognition of the need for people who are acting on behalf of someone to actually support that person to make their own decisions rather than just jump in and say, now I'm the decision maker, I'm making decisions. Sorry, Patricia, Philippa, you're on mute. 
I beg your pardon. I think everyone's got a few people in their home at the moment. And uh, I had someone who was getting a little noisy. I do beg your pardon. Um, I'd like to take some questions here. And uh, and that's really helpful. Um, there's, there's some really, people are concerned that um, Anne made an enduring power of attorney and advanced health directive many years ago, needs to update and make a new one, but nothing's changed since her address, except her address. Uh, what should she do? Doesn't, I'll jump in, doesn't necessarily need to um, change that. Even when new legislation comes into force, it will tend to recognise pre-existing instruments and during powers of attorney advanced directives. The key thing though, is there to make sure that relevant people have the documents and know about the existence of these documents. It's one of the reasons why there's a move to have a national register of uh, financial enduring powers of attorney, because technically you can make an enduring power of attorney or a bank directive, put it in your filing cabinet and no one ever knows it's there uh, and forgets it's there. So the, the important thing there is just, just make sure people have a copy of the uh, relevant documents. And um, we've got someone that said that they that they actually lodged theirs with Centrelink. Are people doing that? And is that something you'd recommend? Look, it's just the main thing is to lodge it with people who need to, uh, particularly who are going to act on your behalf. That's the main thing. Sometimes a bank will, uh, will ask for a copy. Um, but the main thing is the attorney, the one who's going to be acting with and for you, is the one who needs to, need to have the copy and then when they utilise it, the particular agency could be a bank, may then ask for a copy as well. Karen may have thoughts on that as well. Well, actually, I've got a tricky question for Karen. Um, Karen, we've got a question from Debbie. The enduring guardianship can conflict with an enduring power of attorney because the enduring power of attorney might not agree with the accommodation the enduring guardianship has suggested. We don't want to get too confused with everything, but uh, could you suggest a best way of addressing this issue? The best way, um, like we talked about at the beginning, is, is getting people around the table and, and getting the best information and input to pick up, you know, from John's point, um, how are we going to inform ourselves? It's not um, as attorneys and as um, decision makers and as people just moving through life generally it's it's good to get good input so so maybe a way forward is well who can advise us is it a, a medical decision um, or financial decision what what inputs do we need and, and a negotiated decision is always best um, otherwise sometimes it's a matter for a tribunal if that can't be resolved but certainly would um recommend getting people around the table and getting some updated advice. Well, John put up his hand here. Have you got a comment, John? Yeah, sure. Yes, just echoing what Karen's saying, but uh, to bear in mind, whenever there is a dispute about the operation of an enduring power of attorney, the umpire is the state or territory guardianship tribunal. They're now usually called a state or territory civil and administrative tribunal. So I'll use the acronym Philippa. QCAT here, VCAT, NCAT, SACAT, State Administrative Tribunal in Western Australia, and the Northern Territory Civil and Administrative Tribunal. So they're the umpire. And in that situation too, assuming the person may also, uh, if they were still had capacity to revoke those instruments, they could do that in the end as well. Or if not, the tribunal would be the arbiter. But Karen's absolutely right. There's a lot of uh, water to go under the bridge before that where you could try and solve this as a kind of mediation. And, of course, that is, um, you know, something of last resort almost. So uh, we've got a question from Claire, and I think that what you might have said might have covered up on this. Uh, uh, revoking an EPA, uh, enduring power of attorney, um, some, uh, Claire has a client who has had a significant stroke. She made her enduring power of attorney and was deemed to have capacity by the hospital. Now she wants to revoke it. She's unhappy in her care home. How can we prove that she has the legal capacity to do this? Sure, to be sensible in that situation to, to firstly uh, um, get some um, evidence that the, the woman in that situation has the capacity to revoke the instrument and then to indeed set up the revocation. 
So um, I also want to let everyone know that there is detailed state and territory information about enduring powers of attorney on uh, the Compass website. Um, so look, thank you. So Karen, I've, I want to ask you, when it comes to choosing an attorney, who is eligible? Who is eligible? Who's suitable? Um, who can't be an attorney? Because let's rule some people out. Um, and who would be eligible and who is suitable? Okay, so I've um, done some minor homework, and unlike John, who's done extensive homework. So essentially, um, and I, this is based off the Queensland legislation, but it provides a really good rule of thumb. So basically an adult, so someone 18 plus, so, so, so not a minor person um, has to have capacity themselves to, to make um, decisions. So the attorney has to have capacity. And, and in Queensland, they can't be your paid carer, um, either now or in the last three years, or your health provider, because that creates this conflict of interest. So that's, that's a really good thing to consider. Or not a service provider for residential care. So all, although people in those roles may know you well, it sets up a conflict of interest and, and not that in level of independence that you want. So you want an independent decision maker. That, that's the suitability factor. And also, if they're going to be your financial decision maker, you want them to have the skill set of making good financial decisions for themselves. So not having a history of bankruptcy or, or similar. Or a love of gambling. Yeah, yeah. Um, and Patricia, I've got to ask you, because you see people in crisis situations, who would you trust to be your attorney? And who do you think makes a good enduring power of attorney from what you see? Um, from my perspective, and it's good Karen's already gone through the technical details, I'll go through the um, softer details. To me, a best, the best attorney would be the person who has engaged with me the most, who knows my value system the most, and who can make objective decisions for me the most. Um, as you said, I see people in crisis, and when crisis happens, either from ill health or whatever, emotions run high. Um, and when emotions run high, people's objectivity go out the door and it, it, may, it might seem logical for most people, and this is, this is going to be true, that it's your loved ones, people who love you the most or people you love the most will be your default power of attorney. But when they love you too much and emotions are heightened in the context of illness, they might not always be the best person to make these types of decisions for you. So my, my opinion on it is choose someone who knows you the best, but at the right time when it's needed will make the objective decision for you in your best interest. Yes, it's tricky. So uh, John Chesterman, what should you think about when choosing an attorney? And I think we'll bring up a slide to yes, uh, sure. about choosing an attorney, which will be available to everyone after this webinar. These are terrific resources. Thank you. Yes, they are. And, um, the main thing really is just echoing what others have said throughout this webinar is that you want to appoint someone that you trust. Um, so you see the first point there, do they understand your values and what's important to you? Key point to make there is understanding your values comes through conversations. That's different to a person saying, I want, if such and such happens, I want this to happen. Um, it's human nature to sometimes have a conversation in that way, but it's much more important that the person who is appointed to make decisions should you lose capacity to do so can work through what you would have done in that situation because we can't predict every potential situation you might be in we can't predict medical advances or whatever might happen in the future so it's much more important that they understand your values rather than you know specific decisions that you think that they think might be made sometime in the future who's got the right skills and abilities so there you might think okay i know someone who's really good at managing money um, and I can imagine them talking to the bank, the other person, and I trust them, they know what I would want. That's the person to appoint to make decisions about finances. 
Um, if you've got a uh, third point there, you want to make sure the person has time to look after your decisions. Um, where they live, is that a factor? We're now, you know, COVID threw out our ability to travel quickly between jurisdictions. It took my wife two and a half months to move up to Queensland to join me, but uh, barring another lockdown, which I don't think we're going to be in again the same way, you can get on the plane very quickly um, from elsewhere in Australia. So the fact that someone lives in a different city doesn't mean they can't play that role for you. But you do want to assess, would they have the time and devote the time necessary to make decisions for you? Um, the fifth point, if a decision about you or your financial interests need to be made quickly, can they be decisive? And that kind of gets to Patricia's point too in the, in the medical realm. You want a person to be decisive and not, you want them to implement your wishes and not, for instance, to be unduly risk averse. You want them to, to make the kind of decision that you would make were you able to do so. And they need to advocate for you. Can they do that? So the example I give there, if you're appointing someone to make medical decisions for you, are they the kind of person who can stop a doctor in a busy hospital and ask questions? Um, are they able to be a strong advocate for you? They're the things to, uh, to think about. It's also important not to let irrelevant considerations influence who you might appoint. You often hear people say, oh, my eldest son or daughter would be very offended if they're not appointed. If someone is very likely to be very offended about not being appointed, that probably wouldn't be a great appointment anyway. You, you want to appoint someone you trust who can implement your wishes and put into practice your values. That's the person. Don't uh, just appoint someone because you think they might be offended if they're not appointed. Um, and look, gosh, that's there's a lot of sensitivities here and I'm not going to name someone, but they say they're uh, their brother has, um, during power of attorney, and has taken mum's cash card and will not return it to her. Was he legally able to do this? Karen? Well, no. Um, yeah, Karen? Sorry, the, the, the brother was the, the attorney? Or? Yes, and he's got mum's cash card and will not return it to her. Is he legally able to do this? Well, not the the not returning. It, it's 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 all context specific on you know whether the they've started acting as, as an attorney and how they've whether that's um, been activated. But um, taking on board the supported decision making approach, it's it's also they need to be guided by what what the older person wants. So um, it's very difficult. Once again, we're talking in general terms and can't yes. really provide specific legal advice to to individuals so yes but i think what you're saying is key is supportive decision making so yeah it's, it's he has mum's cash card he should be showing her the bank statements he should be providing receipts for everything he should not be mixing his own finances or doing his supermarket shopping on mum's cash card there should be an absolute separation Absolute separation and transparency, because that's when, um, you know, that's often a red, red flag for people, um, you know, other family members or, or other third parties, that um, the more transparent, the more relaxed and the less stressful this all these circumstances become. Now, um, I know of Enduring Powers of Attorney, where, you know, you've got the three uh, older kids on the Enduring Power of Attorney, and we have a question. Uh, if you have multiple people uh, on a enduring power of attorney, if they're making a big decision, is it does it have to be unanimous or a majority? It depends what's on the, on the document, really, Philippa. That um, if the the document might say majority alone, the document might say decisions can be made um, separately or individually, or that decisions to be made jointly. But um, there's, there's basically an obligation for attorneys to consult each other on, on decisions to be made, and that can be stipulated in the document as well. So, so they need to consult each other as, along with the adult or the principal of making the document in supporting them. Well, that's wonderfully helpful. So we've covered off on a few of those questions that are coming through. And uh, and Karen, while I've got you here, what are some of the issues that can, can arise that are tricky and how do you mitigate them? 
You might have a case study or one of many. One, one, of, one of many. And, and so often not being included is, is, is really stressful and not, so not following that supported decision-making approach. So it could be as simple as a person now in receiving aged care and um, the attorney may well be doing their job or may not be doing their job, but they, the person just wants to know and see their own bank statement and um, the person, the attorney becomes quite affronted and doesn't think they need to share that information. And um, so to mitigate against that, you can write that in, in your enduring power of attorney in the, in the first place, but also um, other third party professionals um, like service providers or GPs and the like can be a point of reference to support supported decision making and just say no no the person wants to know um, just the person can receive information like a bank statement it doesn't mean that they're going to set out and make all their own decisions it's just a matter of reducing anxiety and including the person so so being transparent and accountable um, can actually mitigate against a whole lot of concerns. Now, look, I know we've got FaceTime, we've got WhatsApp, we've got all these platforms which we can have instantaneous uh, conversations with people overseas. But what do you say to your clients? Um, you know, we've got a question from Nan. My only child lives overseas. Can he be my attorney guardian? What do you say? And I know it's different for a lot of situations and you can get on a plane. John and okay. Karen. Uh, you, you go, Karen, then I'll go. Yeah, but there's no um, reason that, that they can't, but the, um, and, you know, as time passes and we've got more um, platforms and, and ways of communicating, it's a, it's about the diligence, that which is the word in the Queensland um, uh, legislation. It's about being able to be on the job or attend to the job. And sometimes uh, time zones can make that um, really awkward or difficult if there's really um, quick decisions that, that need to be made. But, but by and large, um, it's not impossible. And certainly we have worked with um, some of our clients and their attorneys who, who are overseas. And, but it's just about it's about planning, really. A lot more has to go into planning around the communication. So um, going back to John's point, it's, the person has to have the time to be able to, to do it and get up at two o'clock in the morning or, or what it needs to be done if they're in a different time zone. Yes, because I'm noticing from our chat, this is something keeping people literally awake at night. You know, they live in Queensland, but a close family uh, member is in uh, the Channel Islands. Others are in New Zealand. And then just a quick question uh, to both you, Karen, and John, and then I'm going to go back to Patricia. How can people know if an enduring power of attorney has been activated? When a, an attorney uh, wants to utilise it, basically, there's, there is no kind of official activation register as such. It's when a person, um, an attorney typically, um, wishes to draw on the document in exercising the power that it, that it gives them. So, so we, we, that's a, a, another question that is leading to our um, development of a national register of enduring power of attorney, the fact that there is the possibility of abuse here. Yes, and I know that Compass and the AAA are doing some very powerful advocacy to try and get a, a national system of registration. It has been uh, a key recommendation of a number of significant national reports dating back, I think, to the Productivity Commission and Elder Abuse Plan. So um, that there is movement afoot, but not fast enough. Uh, so, Karen, you've given some key insights into um, examples of best practice, and it really is about supportive decision making and transparency and accountability. So, Patricia, I'd like to bring you in now, um, and, and you did touch on this, of who should not be your attorney 
and of course not giving any identity but give us some examples in your experience of who's not a good attorney maybe you might challenge some of the stereotypes and and you did sort of point to this before that people can love you so much they don't want to let you go or or do or make hard decisions which might be in your interests yeah um in in bo both you and john have mentioned the word elder abuse uh, so i think it segues nicely into that because unfortunately my other area of work is in elder abuse um and what we do know is that there are risk factors to abuse. With power comes responsibility and the potential to misuse that power. And so we do know that perpetrators of abuse do have a little bit of a uh, characteristic or profile. So say, for example, um, if that person might have a history of um, physical or mental illness themselves, if they have a history of alcohol or substance abuse. Um, we've mentioned um, being able to manage money. And so if they've had issues with mishandling money in the past, it might not be ideal that they're your attorneys. Um, but the other things that we're seeing in the elder abuse space is that perpetrators also have sometimes dysfunctional relationships. And, and there are a lot of relationships that we have to manage within our family dynamics. So if there's been a history of domestic violence, for example, the children may have grown up in a, situ in a household where this was perpetuated. And so um, we need to be alert to those scenarios. Um, uh, uh, John had mentioned the child who might be offended or the person in the family who might be offended. So having those dependent relationships, if you are then thinking of appointing your child or your spouse, if there is a really difficult dependent relationship that might be a feature uh, or, or a risk factor for abuse. Uh, and then um, in the latest research around elder abuse, we're seeing a sense of entitlement so children who have a sense of entitlement to their parents' assets, um, if that is present, it might not be a good um, characteristic for a potential power of attorney. Mm. And um, I know it varies from state to state, but we've just had a question uh, from Anne and, uh, and I might have to bring uh, John and Karen in again, or one of you to break down exactly what powers are covered by an enduring power of attorney? Who'd like to take that? Sure, sure I'll just come. And um, so with a financial enduring power of attorney, you can appoint someone to make financial decisions for you. In some jurisdictions, you can do multiple appointments of different areas in the same document. So financial decisions, that's one area. Then there are other areas of decision-making around medical treatment and personal lifestyle decisions such as where the person lives and who has access to see the person. So the confusing element there is that sometimes in some jurisdictions, those personal decisions, medical treatment decisions are part of the enduring power of attorney. Other juris some jurisdictions, they're called an enduring power of guardianship or enduring guardianship or substitute decision-making regime or medical treatment decision-making regime. It does depend which state and territory you live in. But the bottom line is, in each jurisdiction, you can appoint someone to make financial decisions, health decisions for you, and decisions such as where you live. And look, thank you. And again, uh, there is a great section on the Compass website showing the differences. And also we have been uh, referred to New South Wales having a very good website through Justice Connect, which I think might be available through Compass as well. Uh, that was justiceconnect.org.au. Uh, and uh, that's come from uh, Heidi from uh, the seniors law team at Justice Connect. Uh, so, um, and thank you for your lovely feedback that you're all getting a lot out of this session and uh, we really appreciate it and um, I, I want to just ask um, factors um, in specific communities and um, LGBTQI and uh, I just a quick comment here from you John and and you Patricia and um, enduring powers of attorney um, around these communities older people who um, may not have uh, secured a lot of their documentation with their life partner for a range of reasons. 
And uh, if I could just bring John uh, in and Patricia too. Sure, the, the key here is the generic point that any attorney knows and understands the, the principles, the person's preferences, and has confidence that they will draw on them in making decisions that they'll advocate for the person were they to meet any resistance. So for instance, a transgender person would do well to appoint someone whom they know will ensure their preferences are observed and respected, for instance, by an aged care facility, should the person need one day to reside in that accommodation setting. So in, in appointing someone, you do well to be thinking about, can I imagine my attorney knowing exactly what I would want and advocating for me in that circumstance? That's really important. And, um... And may I ask um, Patricia to come in here and just some some of what you see uh, uh, in Darlinghurst, it's, you know, a traditional heartland for LGBTQI people in, in, in Sydney at, at, at least. And just um, some of your uh, considerations there, please. Um, th thanks, Philippa. And I might just build, a, build on what John had mentioned. Um, the most common setting here is that when that older individual um, of an LGBT background needs to go into care. A lot of our aged care facilities are what we would call faith-based facilities, and there is some concern around um, faith-based practices and whether or not that aligns with that older individual who needs to then go into care. Um, the good thing for me to say is, and I don't know if it's because of where I work, but Although these are concerns, I'm actually not seeing them impact on care and impact on practice. So that's a good sign that things are going in the right direction, that on a practical level, on the ground, I'm actually not seeing these are, in my practice, theoretical concerns, but I haven't seen them impact on care. So, so that's that good. That's a good thing. So I'm hoping that with increased awareness and with sessions like this, that that actually translates to um, um, other places as well. Yes, because uh, traditionally there have been some fears that life partners might not be uh, given the consideration um, that they would as life partners and um, and or now um, spouses because of um, same-sex marriage. Um, so Look, we've covered so much ground. I hope everyone's had their pen and paper on hand. Uh, I hope you'll go back to the recording. Um, I know that you will get a lot out of the material which will be sent to you in coming days along with the recording. And of course, there's the incredible Compass website with so many rich and diverse resources. And it really gives you a national snapshot with state and territory breakdowns, which are important because we don't have a national approach, but that's something again, that Compass and the AAA are um, advocating for along with so many people with the interests of older people at heart. I, I think to wrap this up, I'd like to hear from each of you, Patricia, John and Karen, about what you would like people to take away with them from today and you know what's at stake I don't want people leaving fearful I want people leaving empowered and I hope we've achieved this but what's your key message Patricia? Um, I'm forever the optimist and what the word that um, caught my attention earlier earlier on in the webinar, um, in that interview or that video we watched, everyone said the word hope. Um, and we always all hope for the best. But if I have done my job well, then I would have also helped you plan for the worst. And, and there's not, I, I, I'm a Girl Scout at heart. I, I plan everything. Um, some people might say that's neurotic, but really, we all hope. But if we have a plan in place, then we don't need to just rely on hope. Thank you. And uh, and John, if I could bring you in. Sure. Thanks, Philip. I'm also an optimist. I'd say my final message would be that um, there are risks in having an enduring power of attorney. Enduring power of attorney could be misused. Uh, but there are also risks in not having one. Um, so if you don't have one, it's possible someone could take financial advantage of you where you not you know, did not have the ability to make your own financial decisions, for instance, or indeed that um, were it necessary, 
an application might be made to the guardianship tribunal in your state or territory for someone to be appointed to play that role. That's not needed if you appoint someone with, with an, through an enduring power of attorney. So I'd encourage everyone to think about what they imagine would happen and what they would like to happen if they were unable to make their own decisions. And the key first point, of course, as we said right at the start of the webinar, is having conversations with key people in your life about this. When appropriate, it might be appropriate to set up the legal mechanism by which your wishes can be met through, for instance, uh, executing, signing and enduring power of attorney. But it's conversations with people around you that are really the most important. Yes. And, you know, we really want people, and we're, I'm seeing this in the chat, to feel confident about making an enduring power of attorney or their duties and responsibilities if they are currently an enduring power of attorney or might be in the future. So Karen, what would you like people to take away with them from this session? Well, all, all of the above points from Patricia and John, but also to just drive down and take those conversations if you do decide that an enduring power of attorney is for you and that would be useful for you, then translate that into a document that is tailored for you. Really embrace it, see it as your job, so that should the need arise, should the plan need to be implemented, it's going to be as seamless as possible. The best way to do that is by conversation, but also documentation. And that can be done in the document or, or other, other modes of um, having that written down. But if you might find yourself in a situation that your views and you're unable to communicate your views and preferences. So it's important to consider that and then translate that into a plan that best suits you. And look, uh, we've had some questions. The best way to do this is through a lawyer. And it's not that you have to go to the big end of town these just just walk us through what you need to do next steps for people who mightn't have done this yet okay so so next steps um book the conversations think about your preferences and then you might want to download the actual documents and see what according to the state in which you're living see what the forms look like um a lot of um it's also available on the Compass website, but other states have particular booklets and things like that. So read up on it all and then um, think about your own advisors. If you, if you already have a family solicitor, talk to them about it. Um, uh, if you have an accountant or whatever, talk, talk to them. So, so next steps is to have a look at it, um, the actual document, and think about how you want to answer it and, and look at some of the, the usefulness of booklets and checklists and the like is that you can think about, well, do these clauses, are they going to work for you? And um, you might want them in your document. So print out some of the checklists and just highlight the ones that are that you think might work for you in your document. Fantastic advice from the three of you. A big thank you to our wonderful panellists, John Chesterman, Karen Williams, and Dr. Patricia Riez. Thank you so much for all you've given us today. And thank you to all our participants uh, for joining us today and for your incredible questions, which has really helped our conversation greatly. Now, if this has raised any issues for you, uh, don't forget the Elder Helpline, 1-800-ELDER-HELP. That's 1-800-353-374, 1-800-353-374. Now, a recording of this webinar will be available either later this afternoon or tomorrow. You can subscribe to the Compass e-newsletter, which is a great resource at www.compass.info to keep in touch with what's coming up. Now, before I go, 15th of June, some of you might know, is World Elder Abuse Awareness Day. There are a whole lot of events organised, so I'd invite you to take a look and go to the events section of the Compass website. That's compass.info. Thank you again, everyone. Uh, this is a call to action. All the best with it. 
And thank you so much for joining me. Goodbye.